the vision is the outcome I want. New patients coming from outside of our ecosystem, from outside of our patient base and our tribe. And let's go get them, right? Let's go into the churches. Let's go into the workspaces. Let's go into the gyms and let's do outside talks. Hello and welcome to the Remarkable CEO Podcast, a show dedicated to chiropractors who want to transform their job into a business so that they can have a remarkable practice as part of a remarkable life, not instead of one. With your hosts, Dr. Pete Camiolo and Dr. Stephen Franson. Welcome back to another episode of the Remarkable CEO Podcast. I'm Dr. Pete Camiolo. And I'm Dr. Stephen Franson. And we are thrilled to be with you here today. And I'll tell you, one of the things that we value here at the Remarkable CEO and the Remarkable Practice is being great listeners. And we have been listening to you, and we thank you for listening to us. We've heard your requests for us to dig deeper into delegation, because I know we have touched on this in previous episodes, and we've heard what you have said and requested for us to dive deeper into this. So we are beginning a three-part series on delegation And yes, it's going to take all of the three parts. There's a lot of things we're going to go into how to become a master of delegation. And why is this so important? Well, because the transition between an owner-operator becoming a CEO, there's a bridge. And that bridge to go to cross is delegation. Yeah, absolutely, Dr. Pete. It is, uh, this is table stakes. To to make that leap from owner-operator to CEO, you've got to become a master delegator. And you know, we talk so often about planning and preparing and executing and assessing and that upward spiral loop of a CEO. Um, the, the execution piece of this is really, really critical that you understand what does it mean to execute as a CEO? Uh, because as an owner operator, if you're a chiropractor, executing as an owner operator means very often you're the one doing the marketing and you're the one doing the conversion process and you're the one delivering the care and the retention process, the patient education uh, that's the execution piece of it, right? The doing, doing, doing. Well, you know, as a CEO, execution so often means that you're the one doing the delegation, right? So execution means delegation uh, as a CEO to create true scalability and durability. And one of the reasons why, Doc, this is such an important subject is because as an owner operator, the tendency is towards uh, control. And you've had a a little bit of uh, an experience with that. And I'd love for you to kind of talk through that and really the the birth of even the methodology. And what I'd like to do is also hit here. Here are the 10 steps really to delegating, delegating well. We're going to dive into a few of them today, but this really births from, you know, from the, we always say we speak from scar tissue. We speak from this place of experience. So you're going to hit this point at some point if you haven't already, and this is going to resonate with you. But this idea of having control, needing control, and how that's ultimately going to be the thing that's going to hold you back. Yeah, I mean, this is an example of scratching my own itch when, you know, when I first started practicing, I think you and I shared some funny stories offline. It was like what it was like, you know, looking back that first year, two years, three years, four years, uh, you know, my nature is I'm a perfectionist, right? So I'm a, I like I like to say I was a perfectionist, control freak, Clydesdale chiropractor, right? So, and I think there's probably a lot of people on the line right now who are like, oh yeah, yeah, that's me, right? So perfectionist, like everything has to be perfect. And then control freak is like in order for me to get that perfection, you know what, I got to control it and do it myself. I got to get my hands wrapped all around. You have to like tease it out of my cold dead hands if you want something. It's like, no, no. And I'll take it back. It's like, just let me do it. You know, by the time I teach you how to do it, I I would already have been done with it and done better. I think that that whole craziness. Uh, And then the Clydesdale of meaning that I'm a workhorse, man. I got, I've got a big battery and, uh, and I'm happy to do the work. It's just like, load more weight on the bar. Let's go. I'll push harder. I'll go stronger. I'll go longer. Uh, you know, and that, of course that, you know, that produced results and a certain level of success. Uh, but man, it was at, at the expense of way too much, right? This, of course, you just start breaking down because it's not sustainable. Uh, and you know, you stop doing some of the things you love, like working out or going on vacation or spending time with your family or what have you. And, uh, as much as we've got this big battery, it's not sustainable and it's definitely not scalable, right? So it's by definition, it's not scalable and it's definitely not durable, uh, which implies that, you know, you could continue to add value 
even in your absence, right? So that perfectionism, that control freak, that Clydesdale dynamic can get you to a certain point, but it'll be exactly what keeps you to, from going to the next level. And I think you just hit on something that's really important is that this is something that will absolutely infect and, you know, to a detriment, your personal life. And this is why if we don't get good at mass, uh, uh, delegating and master this process, this is going to, it's going to land on your personal life and it's going to land in your own health. It's going to land in the health of your family. The people closest to you are the ones that actually pay the biggest price. It's you and the people closest to you. And that's why, you know, we, 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 we say you can have a remarkable practice as part of a remarkable life and not instead of one, if you do these things, right? So if you do this, then you can have that. And this is one of the, if you do delegate and delegate well, then you can have that. But if you don't, you cannot have that or you will have a version of it. And it's not going to be what ultimately it can be. Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately in chiropractic, um, too many people, too many docs that I know, docs that I've worked with, they've yoked themselves with the mission, right? The, with the purpose of chiropractic. And very often they get, you know, we get inebriated with the mission and the purpose driven uh, dynamic of running a practice. So we start to justify the brokenness, right? So, and, you know, as much as that's admirable, honestly, and it's, and it's, uh, and it's honorable, um, it's not sustainable <laughs> and it's not scalable. And that's why we see the trail of tears. You know, we see the broken marriages, we see the broken bodies, we see chiropractors not lasting as long as they should either in practice or in life. So this is not a selfish pursuit. I hope everybody really hears this, right? So this is very purpose-driven, very mission-driven, I want everybody, every chiropractor, we need every chiropractor to make, a, um, to make a massive contribution over a beautiful 30, 40, 50, 60 year arc, not a flare out where you just peaked in five years, six years into practice and burn out and then you want to, you know, you break down and you quit and you abandon everything, you burn it down, that kind of, we see that too much or the, the practice that, you know, somebody gets trapped inside of and they end up, you know, breaking their marriage or not knowing their children or just resenting the business uh, because it's kept them from having the remarkable life. So ultimately, gang, it's about creating a remarkable practice as part of a remarkable life, not instead of one, which means you want to create the business that's going to support the remarkable life and not compete with it. So I'm talking to leaders here. We are talking to you. You're a leader as you, as you listen to this. And so one of the things we know is that in order for you to lead yourself, you have to know yourself. And so on the spectrum of delegation, capacity, and mastery, all, there's, a, there's a wide spectrum from zero to 100%. Um, and, and you find yourself somewhere in there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through the 10 steps and we're going to start digging into some of them. But just so you know, you know, these are all things that are part of becoming a master delegator. And so some of these things you may be like, yeah, I do this well. Some of these things not so well. We understand that. Um, but again, we're all on this journey. We want a journey with you. And we feel that at the end of even just this series of, of podcasts, as you listen to these, you're going to have a lot better grasp on what does it mean for me to become a master delegator. We know that we're all a work in progress. and We're all working on this. And as you change and you move into a new chapter or season of your four season career, this will be tested again. And so the beauty is, um, you know, it's an ongoing process. So just to, to walk you through it. So there's 10 steps to mastering delegation. And we're going to unpack these over the next few episodes, but let's go through those 10. Number one is identify specific desired outcomes. Number two, identify actions that produce outcomes. Number three, apply the 80% rule of delegation. Number four, identify the best qualified team member. Number five, set expectations and agreements. Number six, incentivize with rewards and consequences. Number seven, train and equip. Number eight, metrics, tracking, reporting systems. Number nine, establish meeting rhythms. And 10 is assess, repeat or pivot. These are the 10 steps. These are the 10 methodologies to master in delegation. Yeah. Now that you've got your pencils out, I know if you guys are anything like me, as soon as somebody starts laying down a list like that, the pencils come out and we start taking notes. So, you know, from a structural perspective, you know, as a CEO, here's the game, right? So ultimately it is 
making sure that you have a clear vision, like what success looks like to me. So vision, right? Vision. And then it's systems, like making sure that you have the systems in place that will predictably create the outcomes that you're looking for. Then it's surround yourself with A players only. Then it's investing in training and equipping those people, setting expectations with them and making sure that they can be awesome at what you're expecting. Then it's train but trust, back off, let them do their work. And then it's trust but verify. In other words, set up reporting systems so you have visibility and then set up meeting rhythms so you establish accountability. So again, this is it. That's, that, that's soup to nuts, what it means to go from owner-operator to CEO. That list right there should be your guidepost. You'd be able to say, okay, so pause. What am I trying to accomplish? Who's the best person to do it? All right, make sure you set up expectations and agreements. Make sure you train and equip them, and then let them do the work but you want to make sure it's trust but verify. You've got reporting systems in place and meeting rhythms. So the reporting systems create the visibility, whereas the meeting rhythms create the accountability. And you know, ultimately, Dr. Pete, I know that you know, with my control issues, so much of my control issues came down to trust issues, right? I just, just had a hard time like giving up that control and trusting that other people uh, you know, would be able to do this as, as well as I wanted it to be done, right? And it was the pain of doing it all myself was a lot less than the pain of giving up the, you know, the or, or surrendering to, you know, the trust process that was necessary for me to be able to delegate one well. So I really think that that's what these first four steps uh, are addressing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we can we can all speak to this um, from from our own experience, right? From from this place of of having done this well or not doing it well. And we're going to dive into, you know, some, some examples here to really unpack this. But I think what you just said there with the trust factor, I think that is a, a key issue for your, your typical CEO uh, who's going to be listening to this is, and that's why I loved how you talked about how it's trust, but verify that's giving you visibility into it. Right. And then you, then you create these meeting rhythms where there's accountability. So I think the scary part with trust is, once I let it go, like what's going to happen? And it's like, no, it's not like you're just, you're, you're, that's abdication, right? So when you, when you, when you turn something over and then you just let them, let them go, it's like, I'm letting them go. Like you said, no, 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 no. You're following through, you're following up. There's this training and equipping, and then there's accountability, there's visibility, you know, there's, there's all it's full circle. It closes the loop. You know, we, we like to talk about the four things you got to get right. You know, the right person in the right role, doing the right work the right way. That's a that's closing the loop. So as you delegate to that right person, and they're doing that right work, and they're doing it the right way, that's that's the training and it's the accountability. And so it's all of that that goes into delegation that makes this thing just become a flywheel. And next thing you know, it's like you can add another person to that to that business within the business. Another person. Next thing you know, you've got your a business within the business that's just cranking. And that's the power of like multiple associates, for example. You know, how could I even bring one in? Next thing you know, you've got three. It's like, wow, this thing's really working. Well, it's because you've created this rhythm and it can work really, really well. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I think of the fact that this is a, this is a continue. This is like a lifelong pursuit, like getting good. At this is a lifelong pursuit because, you know, on the other side of, you know, the practice stories, I could talk about the story that we've gone through here in the last couple of years, just personally, you know, my wife, Camilla, uh, who's a chiropractor as well, has absolutely zero training in, you know, fin in finance and, and financial management, accounting, taxes, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, Camilla ended up in the, in, as the reluctant sort of, you know, CFO, <laughs> you know, like for France and enterprises. So, you know, we've got multiple businesses, but, you know, she was the one that from the very beginning was always in charge of managing the money, right? So I was in charge really, I, I said, all right, so honey, I'm going to make the money you're going to manage the money, right? So we've got to divide and conquer this. So, you know, she, here's, a, here's a person who's like, has absolutely no professional training in it, has no passion for it. It is not her unique purpose, right? Like there's no, no formal um, education or training or experience in this space. Next thing you know, she's like the reluctant CFO running, you know, running the business. Uh, slash controller slash banker slash mail opener. You know, I'm sure everyone's like, oh yeah, no, I got, I'm married to that person, right? So, you know, and we kind of got away with it as we ran this mom and pop shop chiropractor, uh, chiropractic office. And it was like, you know, we could, she kind of got locked into that role. And in that role, she started to develop her own addiction 
to visibility into the business, control of the flow of the money. And she, you know, and that brought her a certain level of peace of mind, which is kind of a funny way to say it because it brought her a tremendous amount of stress, right? So it's like, you know, the, the fact of the matter is there's a lot of money moving around and that's a stressful thing, especially if you're not innately uh, gifted or interested in that's not your unique calling. So, you know, we've, we've grown up quite a bit as, as business people and it's amazing to look back what's what we've done in the last five, six, seven years. Uh, but Camilla still found her, herself in that seat a couple years back. And the complexity of our businesses now, just it became really, really obvious. It's like, oh my gosh, I need to go and rescue my wife, right? I need to double back and I need to make sure I surround her with the right team of people who are qualified to, you know, to, to help us really be good stewards of the, you know, of the treasure, right? So making sure that we are, you know, demonstrating the capacity to manage well the things we've been trusted with, right? Laura Dominion said, I needed to get a team around her. Now, what was interesting, Doc, is um, what I found was she was really reluctant to give up the visibility and the control. And she hated the job, right? She, we knew she hated the job, but she needed to have the visibility and control. And I'm like, okay, that's what we need to reconcile. I needed to make sure that she knew, listen, we have the right people doing it. We're going to set up systems, processes, expectations, and agreements. We're going to work hard together. And you know, we're going to create the reporting system and the meeting rhythms that she absolutely needed. And you know what happened there is on the other side of it, once we had the right person in the right seat doing the right work the right way, we now have greater visibility and, gr and greater accountability to our financial picture and to the business side of our business than we've ever had by a factor of 10x. And finally, she's got the peace of mind that she was looking for. Yeah, I mean, it's such a, such a beautiful uh, context and story. And I think you spoke to so many factors there. But one of the things, Doc, I'm hearing you say, and this is for our, you as a listener, and this is I know for our clients is they want to scale. You know, you want to grow. You know, we, we say the four seasons, you go from launch into build, then scale, then exit. And what you've talked about is this is navigating through scaling, exiting, building, scaling again, like navigating all of that. And so even the, the ability to delegate, one is you, but then when it becomes someone on your team who now this has to happen for, now how have you done at, delig at becoming a delegation master? Because your ability is now going to be transferred to, to helping train the next person to be able to do that. You see how this grows? So as your organizational chart and you look at it, as it becomes more populated with people and there's accountability charts that you have to manage more people and there's accountability, that to me is where this becomes valuable. You say, what's the, what's the value of me becoming a delegation master? You go back to the whole thing. What's your vision? What's your vision of success? What, do you, what does success look like to you? What's important to you? I know in your relationship with your wife, what's important to you is her peace of mind. And that's one of her core values, your core values, but I know for her, high value. So how do you get peace of mind as a core value? For me as a human being, we're talking human being level stuff. It's like, that's important for me as a human. That's important for me as a human being doing a job or work. And that's driving this value. And so realize that as you learn how to delegate well, this is something you will pass forward and you will teach other people to do within your own organization or organizations as you grow and you scale. So the goal here is that we reach more people with chiropractic. The goal is that we reach more people through the good work that you, you are doing and your company and your organization or organizations are doing. And so this is be, be a gift that keeps on giving over and over again. So to master it yourself is only so you can pay, do a better job even paying it forward. Okay, let's take a quick break and talk about Cairo Matchmakers. Cairo Matchmakers will help you find the right person for the job. If you're looking to hire the ideal chiropractic assistant, Cairo Matchmakers will help you find the specific person missing from your team so that you can get back to using your talents to serve more people. Or if you're looking to hire the ideal associate doctor, CMM can help. Cairo Matchmakers helps chiropractors like you find the ideal associate doctor to unlock your practice potential and get you the freedom that you desire. To learn more, go to chiromatchmakers.com. And now let's jump right back into our conversation. 
Excellent. So I think that's a perfect segue into this first step, right? So as we get into the 10 steps of delegation mastery, and remember, CEOs, this is you executing now. This is you doing your job, right? So, so much of the CEO's role is execution and an execution of delegation, okay? So that first step is before you can delegate, you need to have clarity around exactly what you're trying to accomplish, right? So to be able to say, okay, so what are the specific desired outcomes? Like, don't rush through this question. Everybody rushes through and they skip right through that first question. Do not make that mistake, right? So you've got to be super, super clear. Fuzzy targets don't get hit, right? So we want to know exactly what are you trying to accomplish, right? So that should be the question you start with. Like, what is the desired outcome right now? Identify that, okay? Is it the completion of a project? Is it to reach a certain goal or metric? Is it to fix an issue or a problem? Is it to build out a team or hire a team member? It, you know, what exactly is the outcome where at the end of the day, you said, perfect, that's exactly what I was looking to create. Yeah, and I'll give you an example. Um, you know, from a, the clinic, the clinical setting, and, uh, and it goes back to right early on in, in practice, getting into practice, and it was, it was about helping my patients get the best results. You know, because I knew that in chiropractic, um, you know, I knew that the power of the adjustment, I knew I can, I can move the bone, God does the healing. I knew that that's what I, I needed to do. But I knew also at the same time, there were lifestyle factors that were absolutely contributing to the rate with which people would heal and, and get better. And, um, and I knew that I had a sense of responsibility because I know what I know. And if I know what I know and I don't tell people, then I'm responsible for that. And I don't want to die one day and be like, you didn't tell them the whole truth. You just told them a version of the truth. And so... I had that 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 weight of responsibility that I knew I needed to teach. So, for example, one of the things I knew I needed to teach was uh, our patients how to take better care of themselves, how to exercise. So, you know, we had we had a lot of patients who were not taking care of themselves. They weren't exercising, and if they were, they weren't exercising correctly. And so, we started. We built into our initial process with the patient journey and their experience was we built a, a fitness class once a week. We started that to say, hey, if you um, want help with this, come. It's a free class. I I'm Dr. Pete. I'm going to be teaching it. And, um, and what was cool was, um, you know, I had a vision for it. I, I had a vision that, you know, our patients would, would come and, and, you know, they would, they would start to do this with us and it would, it would be, become this, this big thing. And next thing you know, like, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be outside, like, cause my office is only 1600 square feet. So like, we'll be in the office, we're actually out. And then next thing you know, we'll be in, in, in the parking lot and then we'll be out at parks. And, um, and then, you know, and then eventually, you know, like we'll have, uh, you know, we'll have this health healing center where we'll have fitness classes going on. And I had bigger visions like birth center and the whole thing. Like I had this vision. I actually found the building exactly where it was on I-24 uh, heading up the interstate. I knew the building. I saw it. It was on my vision board. I had it. And I took the label of the, the hospital off and I put the label of my healing center and, and I, and I saw it and it was so clear. What was so cool was it started as, as a vision, an idea that, that really was rooted in what's going to be the best outcome for my patient, right? So the best outcome, and I started as just, it wasn't a financial thing right away. It was like, for me to deliver these care plans and for me to have great results and then retention, I need to support my patients with their lifestyle. And so the outcome was one, I wanted results for my patients. Number two, I knew my reputation was on the line in my community. And I wanted to be known as the chiropractor that people went to that that chiropractor, not only does he, is he a great adjuster, man, we get a great adjustment, but man, like he's teaching us how to be healthy and well. And by the way, he's actually supporting us. He's, He's teaching us classes about how to exercise and eat right, et cetera. So I wanted, to, I wanted to be that guy who there was a stickiness factor to the people coming in. It's like, well, why, why would we leave? Where else are we going to go and get all the things that you guys give us? So we built it in initially as just this free service. What's so cool, Doc, and I have pictures on my Facebook page of um, like these parking lot workouts where we had 100 people showing up on Saturday mornings to work out with us. A hundred people. I have, I have pictures of us at the park, literally with like hundreds of people working out, doing workouts in a local park because of what started as me with, I remember my first patient was a pastor and his wife, just the three of us working out on a Saturday morning and, and what it birthed into. And then it turned into, we opened a, a actual gym that was attached to our center, ended up selling that gym years later. But 
think about this idea that we started with a desired outcome that I wanted to drive. I want my patients getting results because I knew the lifestyle that needed to happen to support the adjustment for them to get the results that I wanted for them. What a perfect example. And, you know, I was, the movie was going in my head, right? So I could see it as you were describing it. It was such, with such clarity and, and passion, you know, it's a compelling story. And, and you know what, I want to stop what I'm doing and help you create it, which is a key to a great vision story and a vision cast beat. Uh, so, you know, I could see it, beautiful example. And, you know, I'm going to suggest that we each grab onto an example, a story like this, and we can just ride it right through, you know, all 10 steps. So, you know, um, as, you know, as I think of an example that we could use, that would be maybe um, a more like, let's look at something that'd be maybe a more measurable outcome driven one where I'm delegating to some team members. What comes to mind for me is putting together uh, an outside talk program. For example, like I want to do a corporate wellness or corporate wellness talks or what have you, health talks. So, you know, for in our practice, a big part of our uh, patient outreach or our community outreach for external marketing was our outside speaking um, um, program. And I knew that I didn't want to be the only one running around town doing outside talks. So I had this vision for uh, having one of my associate doctors work alongside my new business development expert and get out into the community network and create relationships that we could leverage into outside talks and corporate wellness programs, health talks, spinal screenings, health fairs, micro wellness fairs, that sort of thing. So I'll, I'll use that as an example of, okay, so I knew what I wanted to create. I knew what the outcome was. I wanted to see a steady stream of new patients coming from outside the practice. You know, we, uh, honestly, we ran a practice that was probably 95% referral for the first seven or eight years. And it got us to a certain level, but you know, I, I can remember being almost prideful, not even almost prideful, prideful about saying, yeah, we're 95% referral, you know, and then somebody that I, respect and love said, well, you know what? Um, you need to get outside your practice because that's where all the people are that aren't in your practice. <laughs> you know, you need to get over the idea of, you know, Hey, I'm just going to let all my patients refer people. So we said, you know, we need to fix that problem. Let's get out and share the message. Let's not wait for them to find us. Let's go out and find them. So the vision is the outcome. I want new patients coming from outside of our ecosystem, from outside of our patient base and our tribe, and let's go get them, right? Let's go into the churches. Let's go into the workspaces. Let's go into the gyms and let's do outside talks. So my desired outcome was, hey, you know what? I'd like to see an additional 15 new patients per month coming into the practice through the efforts of our outside talk program. So good. I um, I, I love the the conviction also that that comes with, you know, that story of knowing, hey, things were going, things were going well for you. I mean, you had 95% of your new patients, 90% coming internally, but there was a compelling vision. So again, this goes back to vision of, you know, and sometimes we need to get stimulated like you, like you had. And it's like, hey, what about, you know, the community getting outside of the four walls of your practice, how important that is. Sometimes we need to get pushed a little bit. And so, you know, seven years in, you know, things are going well. It's like, uh-oh, you know, so What's the next thing? So what is the specific desired outcome that you have right now, Doc? As you're listening to this, what's a specific desired outcome you have that something that you, you know that you're being stimulated? I need to delegate this. And then the second thing is identify the actions that produce those outcomes. So for you, it was, hey, I need to find the right, you know, get, the, get an associate doctor, but I need to start going out into the community. I can already think of the list of things to do to be able to land, to get 15 new ones coming in from outside talk. I can, see, I can see the list of things that need to be done in order to drive that in my mind. But so for us, for the fitness, honestly, it was right away. We built into our day one, day two, day three process. Hey, every Saturday morning, and we put a flyer up and we had it on the wall, Saturday morning workout with Dr. Pete. It's what it started as. And it was simply, and what we wanted to do is we just wanted to invite people to start to come. We didn't realize it was going to turn into how quickly it would turn into people bringing referrals. So we got a lot of referrals right from that and new patients straight out of it. But it was, hey, I'm adding value. So you know, for me, the first step was, you know, what's the next step that we need to do? Identify the action that produces outcome. Number one is we built it into the process. That's what we did. We made a pro. We had a process that people went through in our office day one, day two, day three, etc. And we built it right into that process and we brought it in back into the re reports as well as the re-exams. And we, we brought it in there. We said, hey, have you, have you taken advantage of the workout? Have you joined us? Hey, and then we would book them for the next one. I remember my associates saying, hey, I want to get you to this next class. 
And they would like literally like holding a person's hand just to get them to come because they knew if we can get this person just to start exercising, this person's going to lose that extra 15, 20 pounds. This person's going to get, you know, the, see the blood work change that much faster. I mean, we knew we would start to see these outcomes if we could just get people to do that. And so number one was putting a date on the calendar. Number two, looking at the process that patients were going through, identifying, hey, the outcomes that we want to create is get more and more of our patients specifically getting there. And we didn't have a specific number, but I'll tell you what, it became something that became its own business. So it worked. Yeah. And Dr. Pete, I'm assuming that, you know, you're a busy chiropractor already at that point, right? So for a guy who built a practice to a thousand a week within your first year. So there was a lot of adjusting going on at this point, right? So, you know, when you, when you looked at taking this on and starting this, you know, new level of service, uh, you knew that it was going to take a certain level of time, energy, and focus that was additional. And and I'm assuming that that was not all going to come out of your ass. Am I right? It was just like, were you, were you starting to think ahead of time? It's like, okay, so I know what it's going to take to be able to deliver this successful workout program, right? So this means that there's going to need some, to be a structure. There's going to need to be some programming. There's going to need to be some promotion and marketing. So you start putting this thing together in your mind. It's like, what are the specific actions that are going to need to happen to make this a successful program, right? So uh, as we talk about delegation, you have to start thinking as like, let's start framing this out from a perspective of, okay, so what is this going to require? Okay, so I know from the outside speaking opportunities uh, that, that for most chiropractors, talking to a group of people and compelling them to take action to come into their office to get their spine and nervous system checked, that is not the challenge. The challenge is, is getting in front of that group of people, right? So I knew in order for us to be able to get more new patients from outside talks, I'm going upstream from that. We needed to be able to do more outside talks. Well, in order to get more outside talks, we had to create more relationships, create more opportunities so that we could do more outside talks, which means we needed to do more networking, right? So uh, the, if you go upstream from the outcome, you look and you say, what are the specific actions that will produce the outcomes I'm looking to accomplish? So this is a CEO skill set, guys. It's not like, oh, I want more new patients from outside talks. Okay, great. That's the outcome. Now you have to ask, going upstream from that, what are the specific actions or activities that are going to need to take place in order to produce the outcome, right? So I want you to be getting in front of a dry erase board on this and say, okay, so way down here to the far right downstream, this is the specific out outcome. Now just take a step back from that. Okay, so what do I need to do? So for this example was produce new patients from outside talks. What's the next step back? Deliver an outside talk. Okay, great. What's the next step back from that? Close an outside talk. In other words, close the opportunity to get in front of a group of people with a decision maker. Okay, great. What is the next step upstream from that? Well, I would have to then have met a decision maker. Okay, so how do you do that? Go upstream from that. I need to do networking, right? Whether it's internal or external networking, whether it's some structured networking event like a, uh, a, a community event, like a chamber of commerce event, or whether it's networking where you go out on your own and whether it's cold calling or just getting out into your community or talking to the owner of the store that you're shopping in, whatever it is, whatever you consider networking, you have to establish those relationships. So we knew the specific actions that needed to happen was we needed to develop new relationships and that's called networking. Yeah, and then that leads into the, the next step in the methodology here of delegation and mass to master is, and this one, this one gets hard for us, and that's applying the 80% rule of delegation. Because, Doc, I mean, at, at some point, like you said, you know, for me, it was, it was, it was I was going to launch it, but I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to keep it, right? So it was going to be a pass, a uh, handoff. And what was cool was I was actually searching internally, and I found the patient who was, who took it over was actually a college football running back who was an athlete who got injured who came into my office and I started taking care of him. And I knew like he's literally spent since he was five years old, his dad played in the NFL. I knew that um, he had spent his whole life um, in the gym and he knew it. And so I started teaching him the fundamentals of what we were teaching, functional fitness, functional movement. And, um, and you know, he had healed up. And so he was the first person that I, that I brought in uh, to, to teach this, right? So because I knew like he was a patient, he was looking for a mentor. I thought he was actually going to be going become a chiropractor. He was really close to actually going that path. He ended up not doing that. But 
it was one of those people I was mentoring and grooming. And he was like, I just want to do whatever I can do to be a part of what you're doing here. And he would come and do the workout classes with me. So it started with him actually attending the class, him working, like actually going through. And I could see like, he's in this, like we talk about heart, head, hands, feet. His heart was in it. Like his heart was there. So I said, okay, hey man, I would love to uh, invite you into this and help me teach. And then I watched and I attended his class, right? And I watched him do it. And I was like, hey, then we met about it. And we had our, we started creating our calendar and we started creating our workouts. And, and so we started building it out. So that was for me, I didn't, I knew that he didn't have the ownership of um, maybe as a leader in the community. Yet. I knew he didn't, he didn't necessarily have his language as, as clear as me. He didn't understand physiology and, and science and all of those details that, but I knew he knew how to work out. And I know he could do at least 80% as good as, as I could do it. And what was awesome was when he took it over, you know, what was the amazing thing is he started, I could see him come alive. Right. And so, you know, when you found the right person and really I'm, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but is, you know, he, he went, I gave it to him knowing like, Hey, he'll, he'll develop this. And, and the goal was he'll take it higher than I could ever, which is actually what ended up happening. But, uh, you know, it's just finding that person that right away can, can start to do at least at 80% of what you can do. So for me, that was that was who that that person was in in my office. Yeah, beautiful. So steps three and four: apply the eighty percent rule of delegation, and then identify the best qualified team member. Right. So perfect illustration of it. So you know that eighty percent rule was taught to me by Dr. John Demartini, one of my real strong influences early on and mentors to this day. Uh, John Demartini saved my life with that rule. Right. So okay, control freak perfectionist Clydesdale operator, <laughs> you know, it's like, listen, uh, you're going to need to, uh, embrace this truth, right? Which is you're creating the own cap on your business by trying to do everything yourself. Uh, you've got to identify, listen, what are the things that you're uniquely qualified at doing? And that's where you need to spend your time, right? So every one of us is a genius, right? So it's like, God only makes geniuses stay in your zone of genius and you need to look and say, what do I need to delegate away from myself to free up more time, energy, and focus for me to do the things that I'm uniquely gifted at doing? So for the control freak, this was brutal and a lifesaver, right? So I had to look around and be like, okay, if somebody can do something 80% as well as I do or better, okay, delegate it, right? So now this is a lifesaver. I'm throwing you guys a life raft right now for my fellow control freaks. If somebody can do something 80% as well as you can, delegate it. Get, off, get it off your plate. And if you do this really, really well, which is step three and step four, you, what you'll find is you're going to spend the vast majority of your time doing the things that you're uniquely gifted at doing. And it's just, this is, this is how you 10x, right? So this is really the secret to real scalability, right? So when you're able to say, okay, so could I find somebody who could do this outside talk program 80% as well as I could? Because you know what? I knew I would be the best networker in my office. I'm going to be the best at it, right? I knew that, at least I thought that until, you know, I met Kendra, right? <laughs> and then Kendra was like, whoa, you know, that's what a new business development expert looks like. This person's magic. Put her in a room. She's going to meet everybody. Everybody wants to talk to her. She wants to talk to everybody. And next thing you know, she did a better job at it than I was. I was like, first, I was like, you know, no, you let me, let me land the big fish. Let me set up the relationship, whatever. Uh, and I'm going to control this. And all of a sudden, I'm like, well, wait a minute. I think she'd probably be really good at this. Next thing you know, I recognized she was 120% as good as I am at this, right? So there's a whole another part of the continuum where the true CEO says, I'm going to hire people that are smarter than me, that are better than me, right? So I'm going to get smaller while my team gets bigger. That was my first foray into that, right? So next thing you know, I've got somebody who I trusted who's actually better than I was at it. They did the networking. And then I said, well, wait a minute. Do I need to be the one running around doing all these outside talks? Maybe I'm the best speaker in the house. Maybe I'm not. But you know what? Is there anybody that can do it 80% as well as I do? All right. So instead of just doing one talk a week, why don't we do three talks a week? I'll do one and let this other associate doctor do two right? Or take my two associate doctors who both could do it 80% as well as I do. And you take this one and you take that one, right? Next thing you know, we're scaling. And you know, when I go on a two week vacation, we don't stop marketing. We don't stop doing outside talks. Next thing you know, there's four outside talks going on while I'm in Costa Rica, right? That's durability, right? So next thing you know, we've got new patients coming through the door, coming out of the woodwork that were never part of our practice ecosystem before because we created a system that had a very specific desired outcome. 
We identified the actions that produced those outcomes. We applied the 80% rule of delegation, identified the best qualified team members, and man, that's when the magic happens. So Dr. Pete, this is a great start to this series. We're going to do a three-part series on delegation. This is part one of three. We've done the first the first four steps of delegation ma- mastery in a 10-step methodology. Looking forward to our next episode. So make sure you check out the next episode. Check out this series. Clearly, this is one that you want to be sitting down with a pen and paper and, uh, and making sure that you're taking copious notes because this, guys, this is the bridge between being that owner-operator and making that identity shift to the CEO. This is the key to creating that business, taking that job and turning it into a business. This really, guys, is the key to creating a remarkable practice as part of a remarkable life, not instead of one. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Remarkable CEO Podcast. Remember, what the world needs now is chiropractic. And what chiropractic needs now is more successful chiropractors. If you like this podcast, please subscribe, share with a friend, and leave us a review. And if you'd like to connect with us personally, direct message us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Instagram. Now go and be remarkable.